ladies and gentlemen, turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. One of Jeremiah's first sermons and is apropos to today. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the Lord said. I remember the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, the joy, if you will, that you had in serving me, the smiles that were on your face when you, uh, we first connected, the love of thine espousals when thou Winters after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown or tilled. Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob. Hear ye the word of the Lord, church. God is the same. He does not change. And all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me? that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you for your holy word all of it, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we thank you for the power and the gift of your Holy Spirit, uh, making your Holy Word plain to us from the Old Testament and the New Testament. We give you the glory, the praise, and the honor for your love, your mercy, and your grace that you have showed to even us as Gentiles. It is amazing love. It is amazing grace. And Lord, for those of us who are truly born again and saved, we individually and collectively confess our sins, our failures, and our faults unto you. Help us to pray, to seek your face, to turn from our wicked ways and to humble ourselves before you and to get back to you our first love. For that's what this passage is about. Uh, The people of God, Lord, turning back to you and getting back to their first love. For that is uh, true New Testament revival for us. Getting back to you, our first love and doing what we do because you first loved us and you put that love in our hearts uh, back towards you. And we served you because we loved you. Lord, revive us again and help us to get back to that point by your grace, by your might, by the power of your Holy Spirit and for your glory, praise and honor and for the salvation of the lost for the revival of the saved. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. By the grace of God, ladies and gentlemen, 
I want to continue to preach in your hearing of a forgotten faith. And we're talking about the church. Part 9, the lost souls of black, of black folk and white folk. Part 23. This is a part of the Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign, Day 722, since January the 20th, 2017. Day 1087, since January the 1st, 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, Abraham Lincoln said, In so much as we know, that by his divine law nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. Abraham Lincoln was a wise man to understand that. For so many people, even in the church, do not understand that. He goes on to say, May we not justly fear that the awful calamity which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins. He was talking about the Civil War. And if we're not careful, you heard it here first, if we're not careful, we will descend into that again in this nation because we have forsaken God. And we're doing and saying things that's going to pop off something that we uh, can't handle. He goes on to say, Abraham Lincoln goes on to say, In this world, may we not justly fear that the awful calamity which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. Ladies and gentlemen, today, from the Lord's message to Israel, through his servant Jeremiah, we see his remembrance of his relationship with his people, Israel, back when he first brought her out of Egypt. The Lord reminds his people of their kindness. You know that first love, kindness and concern and obedience. Their loving espousals and commitment. Their willingness to follow him even into the wilderness. And their pursuit of holiness before him. And we have already dealt with all of that. Because of all of this, she was richly blessed. And defended by the Lord for many years. However, all of that is in the past here. Israel has turned her back on the Lord. And the Lord laments, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain, empty, like so many of us today in the church. 
we're full of vanity. We're concerned about material things, money. We're concerned about what group we're in, what clique we're in, how we are viewed and how we are seen by others. And have no concern for God who brought us out of Egypt. Regarding this passage, Dr. Warren Worsby said, When the Lord gave the Israelites his covenant at Mount Sinai, he entered into a loving relationship with them that he compared to marriage. <clears throat> In the book of Jeremiah, he says, They broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. In the Old Testament, Israel's idolatry is compared to adultery and even whoredom and prostitution. At the beginning of his of this covenant relationship, the Jews were devoted to the Lord and loved him and served him. But once they conquered the promised land, really, once God conquered the promised land for them, their hearts lusted after the little g-gods of the nations around them, and they sank into idolatry. And let me tell you something. If it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, if it had not been for your... Uh, trust in Christ as Savior, you wouldn't be where you are today, and you know it. And yet, so many of us have forgotten God. We have forgotten our faith in Him. It's all about what we can get. I told my children when they were younger, you can't just be happy and excited about going to Chuck E. Cheese. You have to be happy and excited and cheerful and joyful before you go to Chuck E. Cheese. And then uh, see Chuck E. Cheese as a reward or as a gift. And then you ought to be just as happy, just as cheerful and joyful as Christians when you leave Chuck E. Cheese. The problem with so many of us in our churches today is that we just love Chuck E. Cheese. We don't love Jesus we don't love God. We love what we can get for, from God and what God has done for us hundreds and thousands of times. The only time we get back close to God is when trouble comes and tribulation comes and problems comes and the money is low. And the debts are high and you are in an impossible situation. Then all of a sudden we want to ring God's doorbell. We want to call on him. But yet we go to church on Sunday mornings. And we give all this praise and this honor and thanks. Uh, we claim. But we don't love him. For Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the proof of your love, of your praise, and the waving of the hands. Because I believe the Lord is saying to all of those folks who are uh, waving the hands, unholy hands most times, uh, giving God the praise, I believe God is saying back, I appreciate the praise, but what have you done for me lately? I have you there to serve me. I am the king. You are part of the kingdom. You need to serve me. Although God had taken the Israelites safely through their wilderness wanderings and given them a wonderful inheritance in Canaan, 
they abandon him for man-made liturgy gods that are worthless. What kind of loyal love is that, dear Christian friends? For so many of us are doing that today. God has delivered us. God has blessed us. God has provided for us. God has shown us favor through Jesus Christ. God has opened up great doors. And uh, what have we done, generally speaking? We have forgotten God. We don't love God as we used to. That's why Jesus emphasized how that we need to get back to our first love. And if he said it back 2,000 years ago, surely it is needed today. Amen, somebody. God asks the Israelites, watch this, what has he done to warrant their idolatrous behavior, their hatefulness, their lack of kindness, their rebelliousness, their stubbornness, their stiff uh, nakedness. What iniquity have your fathers found in me? This is the jilted wife. This is the jilted husband in, in, uh, in our times. As soon as one is ready to bolt and ready to leave, the first thing is, what have I done? Now, we as sinners, we know what we've done to run them away. What have I done? But God, had, God didn't do anything wrong. God has never done anything wrong. And he is no doubt asking to the church, what have I done to you? For you to go running out here whoring around with uh, false gods, materialism, seeking money, committing all kinds of sins against me. The obvious answer is nothing. God has never done anything wrong against his people, the Israelites or to Christians. However, today we sing about the goodness of the Lord. We write and read and even pray about how faithful the Lord is, <clears throat> but we don't live like it, do we? How many sad stories have you heard of husbands and wives, Christian husbands and wives, seemingly made for each other, seemingly have a perfect marriage, yet one spouse ends up committing adultery with someone else, oftentimes in the church, and the marriage ends in divorce. You say to yourself, man, it seemed like they had it all together. They looked like the perfect couple. And you wonder what went wrong. Well, beloved, that is how God expresses himself towards Israel in this passage, and I believe towards us. That is how he expresses himself to us today. God, of course, does not change. God has never done anything wrong to any of us. He has blessed all of us beyond measure. You say, well, he has not blessed me beyond measure. Maybe you're not his child. I don't know. Or maybe you have not taken the time to count the blessings that God has bestowed upon you. If he was faithful and loving and kind 2,000 years ago, he is the same today. Jesus Christ is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. So who has changed? Not him. We have. If he was good and merciful and wise and holy when we first came to faith in Christ, he is still all of that today. He does not change. He's the same. And by the way, the God in the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. Uh, Brother Andy Stanley, he has not changed. God is consistent all the way through. Yet the Lord asks, why have you gone far from me? Why have you engaged in vain pursuits, empty pursuits? It's all about your makeup. It's all about your money. It's all about your new shiny car that you think other Christians are paying attention to and they're not. It's all about your what, what neighborhood you live in, what, what zip code you're in, what school your child goes to. I never thought, I really, I never thought that people were so hung up on the prestige of the uh, school your child went to. To the point, we got white folk out here buying, bribing schools to let their ignorant children in. And uh, I thought they were getting in the right way. Uh, one of the one of the young ladies who got in, she said it very clearly. It's on it's on on video on YouTube. I don't care anything about school. But that's what we're caught up with today. Not only white folks who have money, but black folks too who have money. It's all about prestige and where you live at and what. Uh, kind of car you drive, how much money you make, vain and empty stuff because when you're lying cold in that grave, none of that stuff is going to matter. And somebody is going to take your $2 million insurance policy you left your wife or you left your husband and they're going to sleep in your bed and live in your house and spend your money. It's all vain and empty. Trying to be something that you're not even supposed to be. Is it something I did? God said. The answer is the same for us as it was for Israel. No. God has never done us wrong. God has never forsaken us. He has never left us. God has been better to us than we have been to ourselves, as the old saints made very clear. And yet we've turned our backs on Him. There are people sitting right here. They heard the gospel. They said they trusted Christ as Savior. They used to be excited about serving God, used to love serving God. And now they act like they're mad at God. Constantly depressed, defeated, sad, and disgusted. Act like they don't even want to serve God anymore. Don't even want to sing the songs of Zion anymore. Used to love them. Don't want to serve God anymore. Used to get mad if they couldn't serve God. It is we who have moved away from the Lord. Not the Lord. The Lord is, is in the same place he was the last time we talked with him. Perhaps like the adulterous man or the adulterous woman, there was nothing wrong with the spouse. We just got a whiff of something new. Something that smelled nice. 
and we followed our wicked noses. And that's what's wrong with so many, listen to me very carefully, that's what's wrong with so many so-called Christians today. You're never satisfied, just like the world. You're not content with anything, just like the world. If, if you're doing what you like to do and you're with who you like to be with, uh, you're happy. You are pleasant to be around. But as soon as you have to do some serious work for the Lord, or it's time to pray, it's time to serve God, you're unhappy. You're not satisfied. You're not content. This is why we have so much adultery in the church today. It's not that the husband is not doing his part. It's not that the wife is not doing her part. You're just greedy. You're not satisfied because uh, you can't be satisfied because you probably have never been born again. People who are truly born again and uh, serving the Lord as they should because they love Him are satisfied people. They're content. They will have temptations, but they just dismiss it and move on. They say no and move on. So many Christians go to church because they're on the hunt, looking for something else new. If I can just have her husband, if I can just have his wife, I'll be happy. They seem so happy, but they're not happy behind their big fine house on Pork Chop Hill. You just think that. Truly born again Christians who are truly serving the Lord, trust me when I tell you, they're going through hell. Do they have good times? Yes. Do they have peace? Yes. Do they have joy? Yes. But they're going through tribulation like all other Bible-believing Christians who love the Lord and who are born again. So you need to stop looking. You see, you have been sold a bill of goods. There's nothing but a lie in the modern church. That everybody is supposed to be, everything's supposed to be perfect with Christians. Everything's supposed to be wonderful with Christians. You ought not to have any problems. You ought to be the head and not the tail, which has nothing to do with what the Bible is talking about. You should always have money. You should always have a nice fine house and a big fine car and, 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 and everything should be going well. Your children ought to be perfect. Y'all ought to be in the best schools. Everything ought to just be just just fantastic all of the time. And ladies and gentlemen, that's just a lie out of hell. You have been bamboozled. You have been deceived. And you have run amok. And the church is in the ditch because of that lie. It's nothing but a lie. I don't care who they are. People who are truly born again and saved. They're catching hell. If they're serving God, they're catching hell. Now, they still have peace, they still have joy, they're content, they're happy in Jesus, but they will tell you, it, 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 it's, uh, I'm going through some tribulation and trouble. Sometimes God will cause the devil to let up for a while, but just rest assured, the devil will be back. And the more you serve God, the more you're doing for the Lord, the more hell you're going to catch from the devil because he's just not going to lay down and let you do that. And so, dear friends, so many Christians, the devil dangled something shiny in front of you. And you decided very foolishly to pursue that just for fun, just for the thrill. Some of you young ladies out here being deceived, showing your behinds to these old men who are married, and uh, they are settled, and trust me when I tell you, once they use you and have sex with you, they're not going to leave their, what they told you, their old hag wife. 
They ain't not, they're not going to do that for you. Okay? And they're just going to use you for their sexual pleasure, and then you're going to be the one left curled up in a fetal position, wanting to bring down this man because he uh, has sex with you or raped you. He's a deacon in the church, and he's a preacher in the church because you was out there flirting with him. And now you want to get him back because he didn't marry you. And some of your old men are being used. Uh, she, she, don't care. she doesn't care anything about you. She wants your house. She wants your car. She wants a credit card, man. She wants money to use you. And when you stop paying that money, then you're going to find out uh, the wrath of a jilted woman. And that's what's happening even in the church today. And you cannot deny it. It's in the newspapers. Subconsciously, we knew that our old faithful spouse would be right where we left them. And we thought we could always go back to the way things were before, after running after the shiny thing. But that is not the case. That's not how it works. And some of you old men are so deceived, you are deluded. You think that you're all that, and you think that that young thing really loves you and likes you. No, 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 man. She likes the aura about you, preacher, deacon. She doesn't love your old behind, man. She likes your prestige. She likes your power. She likes your authority. She likes the fact that you are a mover and a shaker. And you can make things happen like that. And that's what she's attracted to. What happens is when you yield to that temptation for that shiny thing, uh, all of that luster, all of that, all of that glow that you had, all of that power, it disappears in her eyes and she begins to despise you. That's how the devil will do you. And that's how the devil is doing a whole lot of preachers and deacons today in the church who have left God, who have forsaken God, and who do not love the Lord as they used to. The covenant has been violated. The relationship has been broken. And unless we come with humility, confession of sin, and repentance, admitting our evil, admitting our sins, admitting our wrongdoing, and returning wholeheartedly to the Lord, we will continue to experience his chastisement, his punishment. Because see, when God chastises us as Christians, he does not do like most parents. He does not quit. He does not get tired. Because he loves us, he will continue to chastise us and rebuke us and cause and allow confusion in your life. He doesn't cause it, but he will allow it in your life. Things are just not going to work out the way you want them to if you stay in your rebelliousness and stubbornness against him, your pride against him, thinking that you can do it, the Christian life, your way. Dear friend, it does not work that way. And so, beloved, in closing, our prayer ought to embody the spirit of these words written by John Major. Alas, my God, my sins are great, 
my conscience doeth abrade me. And now I find that at my strait no man hath power to aid me. Thee I seek, I merit not, yet pity and restore me. Be not thy wrath just God my lot. Thy son hath suffered for me. If pain and woe must follow sin, then be my path still rougher. Here spare me not, if heaven I win, on earth I gladly suffer. But curb my heart, forgive my guilt, make thou my patience firmer. For they must miss the good thou wilt, who at thy teachings murmur. Then deal with me as seems thee best. Thy grace will help me bear it. If but at last I see thy rest, and with my Savior share it. Let's all stand for prayer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are three things that we as Christians ought to do in light of a message like that. If you are a Christian, a believer in Christ, and uh, your heart feels heavy under the Holy Spirit conviction, I'm talking to people who know what I'm talking about. Here are three things you need to do. Number one, confess and repent of the sins of your own heart in life. And some of you need to confess some inner sins. You're living a lie, and you know it. You're living a lie about some evil you have done. You're living a lie about some evil somebody else has done to you. Or you're living a lie because you're covering up what other people are doing. You need to confess it to God and confess it to them and to others if necessary. And let the chips fall where they, where they may. You already know what these sins are that are burdening down your soul and your spirit. Confess them to God. Repent. Confess some things to others. Get it right. And move on with your life. Stop cluttering up your soul and spirit with trash, evil, sin, and garbage that you have committed and that others are committing. Number two, pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ to repent of their sins and get back to their first love, Jesus Christ. Pray for souls to be saved and do your part by witnessing to the lost. If you have not witnessed in a while, your church probably does not have any gospel tract pamphlets, go and uh, to the Christian store somewhere, if, there, if you can find one now, so many have closed and go to the track rack and buy some gospel tracks. And when you go to Walmart or HEB or A&P or whatever your grocery store is, on your way to your car, drop by three cars and leave a gospel track. If you're in Texas, they, they, they normally they will not say anything to you because most many of the people are church-going people themselves. So do something. Uh, that'll get you started. And then if God has laid uh, somebody on your heart, if you're saved, if you're born again, I assure you God will lay somebody on your heart that you ought to witness to. You just go over, uh, not seeking, seeking anything but their soul. And you sit down with them. And you share the gospel, how you got saved. If you can't, if you're not uh, familiar with the verses, just share your testimony, what Jesus Christ did for you. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you the glory and the praise and honor 
for your holy word. Have mercy and grace upon such wretched and uh, wicked and evil and ungrateful people as we are. Forgive us for Jesus Christ's sake of all of our sins. Of not loving you back, knowing that you first loved us. Not serving you as we should from a pure heart. And uh, forsaking you, getting caught up in the shiny things, lusting after the shiny things and the glittery uh, things of the world. Help us by your grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit to dig down deep in us and help us to confess our sins, to turn from our evil ways and to repent. There are some in our churches and in our families, Lord, they've allowed the devil to enter into their lives, to oppress them and to defeat them. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you cast out the devil and the demons of hell out of the lives of people who have allowed the devil to take up residence in their lives through watching pornography or uh, being involved in seances and all kinds of evil, wicked, ungodly things uh, involving themselves in yoga and uh, other stuff. So, Lord, you know who they are. They know who they are. Help them to confess their sins and repent. Some are just caught up in witchcraft. Some are just uh, pharaohistically proud and stubborn and rebellious uh, and disobedient and they're practicing witchcraft and, uh, and that's how they have allowed the devil to enter into their lives. Lord, help them to repent and to, to uh, become and to be obedient and uh, to turn away from their evil ways and uh, to submit to the authorities that you have set over them and to have a cheerful, joyful spirit even in the midst of trials and tribulations. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and forsake. Amen. You may be seated. Now, dear friend of mine, if you're with us today and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, in the free pardon of your sins, if you have never been born again, please allow me to show you how you can be saved from uh, the power of sin and from the punishment of sin uh, in that awful place called hell. And that's my main job as an evangelist. God called me to be an evangelist right from the start. Uh, God has never called me to be a pastor or a priest or anything like that. But he's called me to be a prophet kind of a guy and an evangelist. I don't call myself either one. Uh, that's just what God called me to do. My main concern has always been for 40 years is to get your soul saved from hell. Now, if you need uh, help in other areas, there are pastors who love to do that. They, God called them to do that kind of thing. And they will help you with your marriage and with your uh, uh, other needs and things that you have in life. And they will counsel you very well. My job is to counsel you about your soul getting saved from hell and getting saved to heaven. And so first, accept the fact, dear friend, that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws. And so have I, and so has the Pope. The Bible says in Romans uh, 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have messed up. I'm talking to people who are irreligious, people who may be atheists and agnostics, people who have not darkened the door of a church in six years or more. Uh, you are a sinner. God told me to tell you that. I am a sinner. Uh, I'm just a beggar telling other beggars where the bread is. Okay? God wants you to be saved today from your sins and from hell. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty. There is a punishment for sin always, as Abraham Lincoln brought out in the early part of this message. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death all day long. We die physically because of our sins. Our bodies will go to a grave one day if we live long enough. Our soul will spend eternity in hell if we don't trust Christ as Savior. 
There's no, there's no such thing as many roads to God. There's no such thing as many roads to heaven. I, I know you want to say there is, and you want to believe that. Uh, your good works cannot save you from hell. You're giving money to great causes. I don't care if you give billions. It will not save you from hell. Your joining a church will never save you from hell. Being in a church will never save you from hell. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And hell is a very real place. Whether you believe that or not, nobody's trying to scare you. Uh, nobody is trying to uh, uh, frighten you. I'm just stating facts. Because Jesus Christ preached more on hell than any prophet in the Bible and most preachers today. Jesus Christ preached more on hell than he did about heaven. Why? Because he loves us and he wants us to be saved from that awful place and he wants us to be saved to heaven by his grace and by what he did on the cross. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10:28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell is an awful place. Hell is a sad place. Hell is a place of gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of darkness. Hell is a place of constant pain and torment. Somebody is going to suffer for your sins. Either you're going to accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross, for he suffered and bled and died on the cross for your sins and for mine, or you're going to pay for it yourself. But somebody's going to pay. Hell is an awful place. Hell is a place of an agonizing memory, a painful memory. And, and nothing can hurt sometimes like a, a painful memory. Hell is bad news, but I have some good news for you. Jesus Christ said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou you shall be saved. Are you saved today? If not, why not? Trust Christ as Savior. Believe in your heart that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again. Pray and ask him to save your soul, and he will, if he can save me. A guy who was raised in a religious environment, dad was a pre preacher, mother was a preacher, but I was hellbound, hellbound until I left home. Someone told me what I just told you. And they shared these verses, Romans 10, 9, and 13. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, you, shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I've been preaching this gospel. I've been preaching these words for 40 years now. And I feel no waste tired. I just love it. I thank God for what he did for me. And I want you to trust Christ as your Savior today. I guarantee you, you will never regret it. So, dear friend, believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he suffered and he bled. He shed his precious blood on the cross for your sins and for mine. He suffered, bled, and died on a cruel cross for you and me. Not for his sins, but for ours. God died for your sins and for me. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, died for our sins. Now you talk about love. Uh, I don't see how you can even wrap your head around this love because I've been serving God and serving Christ for 40 years and I still can't get my head around this kind of love. It's, it's, it's just amazing. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. All you have to do is believe on him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou, you, shall be saved. If you're willing to do that right now, 
please follow me in prayer. We call this the prayer of salvation or the sinner's prayer. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight. I have broken your Ten Commandments. I have lied before many times. I have stolen things before. I have taken your holy name in vain. I have lusted after people and things. I've disobeyed my parents and I've dishonored my parents. For Jesus Christ's sake, please have mercy and grace upon my soul. And for Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my wicked sins. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. And change my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me to repent of my sins past. And help me to turn from my evil ways. And to follow you, Lord Jesus, for the remainder of my life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, dear friend of mine, if you believed in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead on the third day, allow me to say to you congratulations on doing the most important thing in life, and that is trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information, to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to GospelLightSociety.com and read my pamphlet titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10:9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Some people... Uh, a shock when I say congratulations you have trusted Christ as Savior you are now on your way to heaven and you're not going to hell they're they shocked by my that statement the reason why I can easily make that statement is because I believe the Word of God it's not about what I have done or what you have done is if you trusted Christ as Savior you're saved that's what the Bible says so dear friend if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior today please email me at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com and let us know. We have some free material that we want to send you. If you have a prayer request, please email that to us as well and we will pray for you until you tell us to stop.